This is the February 7th, 2013 meeting of the Situate Planning Board. Uh, I need a motion to accept the agenda. So moved. Do I have a second? I second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 The first item on the agenda is the public hearing for the zoning articles that have been prepared for the annual town meeting. Uh, these articles are identical to what was published in the legal ad. It's been available at the town hall and available at the town clerk's office. I think copies have been provided to people in the audience. We have them listed as uh, medical marijuana, flexible open space, village business, and accessory dwellings. If the board would so indulge me, I would do accessory dwellings so that we can get some of these people home earlier I, than later. I see some people waiting so that I recognize, so. <laughs> All right. Okay. You may want to raise trouble on that first article, though, so maybe you should. <laughs> just kidding, just kidding. Next year. Okay. Well, that sounds good. So we will do accessory dwellings as the first article. Bear with me while I get my copy of it out. By way of background, the proposed changes includes <coughs> changes to sections 200, 420, 530, and 560 to add definitions to limit accessory dwellings to a maximum of two bedrooms and 90 square feet for floor area. It eliminates the affordable accessory dwelling section, which really, according to the state, has not been used at all. Um, and move the provisions for accessory dwellings into the business district, into the village business overlay district. So they'll come back up and fit in with mixed use. And finally, we include the certification process where the owners will annually certify to the planning board that they will reside on the property. Which is a concern. So having said that, let me ask if there's any questions from the board. Okay, we'll open it up to the public. I have a question. We uh, have we, an affordable accessory dwelling. My name is Deborah Burke. We, we, we need to get your name and your address. Okay. My name is Deborah Burke. Yep. Spelled D E R K. Um, I live at 202 Old Oak and Bucket Road. Yeah. And um, we actually had the first permit, I think, for an affordable accessory dwelling. Mm -hmm. And it is indeed still there on our property. And when I saw in the manner that you were eliminating them, I wasn't really sure what that meant to us, given that. It won't mean anything it to won't? you. No. No. Okay. No, you're, you're grandfathered, so the new law only applies going forward, so it won't have any effect. You'll still. Well, it, you can, you there can may assure be. of a. Yeah. A, yes. Of yes. Okay. Will it yeah. rescind the. Uh, I mean, we have yes. a thing in the Registry of Deeds okay. that's an agreement. Yeah, it won't make any difference. The, the okay. law, when you pass a new law, it only affects going forward. It doesn't affect going back. And so you're considered grandfathered. So everything that you have is still in place. And, Statement yeah. of fact. Yes, yes. absolutely. Yeah. All right. He's a lawyer. We, yeah, I'm an attorney. So. <laughs> well, that was a real concern. I'm not yes. an attorney, but I played one on TV. Yeah. <laughs> but, but going forward, no one else will be able to do affordable accessory because we're eliminating that section. It hasn't been used. And oh, that's I imagine the reason it hasn't for been used much yet. Yeah. Hasn't been used at all. That's no. the reason Other than for eliminating But it. I want to point this out, given that, that um, well, Laura's not here, but she was a big help to us in obtaining, you know, the permit, and we were figuring out what the rules were going to be and so on and so forth. And when I actually got a tenant in there, I contacted her and I contacted the housing authority, and no one responded in terms of my, in other words, I have an affordable accessory dwelling which should be counted towards our quota, right? Right, mm -hmm. it's, true. It's, yeah. it's a good thing for situation to be doing <coughs> this, I yep. think. Mm -hmm. But it sounds like no one really knows how to go about it. I mean, I said, do you want, do you have a form that you want me to fill out? What do you want me to do? I'm not going to send my tenant's W-2s just over there. I need to have some kind of a format in which to do it. I don't know if I'm the only person, but certainly there is one <laughs> yeah. affordable accessory dwelling, and you might want to talk to the housing authority or something and find out if there's some way that we could be counted, yeah. you know, towards the percentage. 
Oh, I'm sure. I'm sure there is. Yeah, I think. I think the yeah, I the reason I, they probably don't pay attention to it is that we're so far away from our 10 percent threshold. That, nobody cares. That yeah. I right. mean, if we are closer right. to that, they'd be counting every single one. But I, the, I haven't looked at it in a while. Right. But we're not even close in Situ. Right. We need a lot more affordable housing here. So. Yeah. Dan, didn't you say uh, that the laws had changed? Like when we first did this, the accessory dwelling and the affordable option, then something happened with the state that kind of made it sort of moot. Or no, no. I think. My understanding is that originally when we passed it, I wasn't involved, but we only had affordable accessory dwellings in town. The town yep. decided that we would only allow this if they were affordable to, to um, encourage more affordable in town. And then there was yeah, a... Yeah, it was a good plan, but I don't imagine that many people have extra buildings on their property that they want to turn no. into. No. And then there was a provision added, which is the, you know, not affordable, just regular accessory dwellings. And at some point, that one was made so much more liberal than the affordable. You have to jump through a lot of hoops to have an affordable one. There's all kinds of requirements and filings and everything, and the town decided they just wanted to have people be able to do regular accessory dwellings without all the affordable restrictions. And as a result of that, we don't get any affordable ones in because I don't know why anybody would do it anymore because there aren't the barriers to doing it. So so that's why we're doing away with it. We haven't had any oh, more so coming in. So we should apply to, the other to one. just have and I doubt you can. You probably that have deed restrictions. <laughs> that was actually my question. Does yeah, this, I, does this uh, imagine, rescind that the no, requirements? I, no, I imagine you have a deed unit? restriction, and when you well, got approved. Uh, yeah. so. Well, it's, it's fine. Actually, yeah. As long as you're not eliminating it. No, right. but actually, yeah, I think we did that. We don't have any fast yeah, yeah, I guess yeah, they might be able to come back and reapply, but it depends on what the deed restriction is and you know what yeah. the covenant was at the time and well, all of that. So fifteen years and that's fine with us. I mean yeah. personally there is a great person and you know, like what I what I'll do is I'll check <laughs> <laughs> I, I personally would like to see more of them, but it's um yeah. Yeah, I think it's, not it's not happening and that's the and reasoning. We're, we're, just so I understand. And we're grandfathered in, the covenant <clears throat> is the covenant. Yeah. End of story. Yep. Yep. Mm -hmm. That was easy. <laughs> Watch the Celtics. <laughs> Just for the record, we got two happy people. <laughs> Anybody else on accessory dwelling? Steven? Yeah, because Steve New Yorkland. Um, I think what you'll find is that it, when it was originally passed, it was not the affordable, but it was a regular accessory dwelling but the requirements were stricter for people to be able to have them. Mm. And you couldn't, you couldn't do additions on non-conforming structures and then put an accessory dwelling in it unless it became affordable. Mm. So they were trying to allow more dwellings to have these type of units in them, but they said, well, if you don't conform now, we'll let you do it, but if it's, affordable. You, it's gotta be an affordable restriction on mm. it if that's the case. So they, have all, they did start with okay. just an accessory dwelling and it was, I don't even know how long ago now, 15 years maybe, longer than that. Yeah. Uh, and, and it was added after. Well, I think maybe I'm thinking of other towns, but when it first came out, a lot of it was supposed to be sort of a carrot, you know, to say, you know, if you do this, it's got to be affordable and we'll increase our affordable stock. And But at least in Situate and a lot of other towns, it's gone the other direction where people just weren't doing them. So they said we should just open it up to anybody to do these. And as a result, they wind up being affordable a lot of the time anyway because they're smaller units and the rental's lower. and. But I think Laura's not here, but she looked to see how many we have had affordable. And I mean, that's the only one I'm aware of. Hey, we haven't had for we had years one, and years. We had one that was earlier this year that we had, no, earlier last year. Yeah. Lately, it, it had to go to the Board of Selectmen because it was affordable. Yeah. The owner of the house was going to Texas and there was a problem with transferring it. So in effect, what we did is we, we came back up and voted an accessory dwelling capability forum and then we had to have the board of selectmen come back up and take away to remove the, to remove the affordable restriction because they couldn't sell their house with the affordable right. restriction on the yeah. unit. So, okay. but so that, that, that's take care of that. To the best of my knowledge, that's the only other one that we've had. So I think there's better ways to get affordable housing that didn't turn out to be what people thought it was going to be. So that's why that's going away anyway. Nobody's using it. So we're just focusing on the regular. Okay. Yeah. I think trying provision. to consolidate and make it easier. Yeah. Okay. Anything else on the accessory dwelling? George Rice, 39 Ocean Ave. <clears throat> are you going to discuss it? I just came in. Are you going to discuss the accessory dwelling, or are you just asking for questions? We're just asking for questions. I think it's it's been out, it's been available. It was in the ad and in the copy that, that that we're looking to go forward with. Right. Okay, so I just had a few questions then. Sure. Uh, <clears throat> I'm a little uncertain. You're, you're suggesting we go from 40 percent 
minimum of 750 to 40%, maximum 900 square foot? I think that's. Yes. Yes. Yep. Uh, also, I see in here, when it refers to core area, net core area, what would be the definition of net core area? It's on the first, it's on the first page. If you, oh, do you, do you have the full? I have the zoning here, and, and I have the, uh, what was online regarding the discussion. Oh, okay. okay, there's well, a. What we've done is, is in fact, yeah. Yeah, we uh, have a proposed new we, one we that you should look at. We added hustle. definitions to section 200, just to make sure they're clarified. And then net floor area is defined as the area of the interior of a dwelling considered habitable space by the most recent official edition of the Mass Building Code. Okay. So that would be like uh, meeting code? Yes. In other words, it's not floor area in an yeah. eave or anything like that. Yeah. 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 Right. And the 4D in this section, it talks about annual certificate uh, and also not transferable. Is that related to the or is that related to all accessory dwellings? They're all going to be the same now. They're all, they're all just okay. accessory dwellings, and so that'll be for everything. So it, it, it's saying here that annually you have to do something, or if, let's say I want to leave the property to my son. Uh, is there anything that he has to do? Yeah, annually you have to file a certification that the um, owner occupies either the house or the accessory dwelling. And also it's required at the time that it changes ownership. So if you sold it to your son or you transferred title to your son, he would have to submit a certification at that point saying that he's gonna live in either the accessory dwelling or the house. So that's all that would require. For instance, say I sold my property to you, mm -hmm. you would just have to certify you're gonna live in one property. And yep. the objective of that is so that someone doesn't have the wrong idea that it's two properties they can rent out. Exactly. exactly. Correct. But it's no reapplying for approvals no. or nothing. No. Else. No. No. It's just a piece of documentation that we. It, it's we a way for really us to, to check on it and make sure that people aren't doing this just to have a rental property that they're not living in. Because the point of it was to help people out initially if they had a right. relative that needed to move in with them or they need a little bit of extra income. But it was never intended to be something you just create duplexes to rent out to people. Right. Yeah. Uh, what's the logic of going from the 750? to a minimum of 750 to a maximum of 900. Well, before, the way it was written, there was a certain percentage. I can't was it 33? 40%. 40%. 40%. Was it? But I mean, if you had like a 10,000 square foot house, I mean, you could build an accessory dwelling up to that, that amount. You could do you know, 4,000 4, square feet, <laughs> conceivably. And now, yeah. it's the, now it's the lesser of. Or conversely, if you had a 1,000 square foot house, you were still allowed to do a 750 square foot right. accessory dwelling almost as large as the house. That's really what got us onto this, talking about this particular change. Has there been any problems with size of these things at all? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you may, ask, right the, here, you may right? ask the front row. <laughs> this came about as a direct result of the last application we had in here that, you know, we, we didn't like the result under the current law, so we looked to change it. But it, it was the right result under the law that we had, but we didn't think the law was really adequate, so. The, the reason I'm sensitive to it is I think the accessory dwelling is a progressive thing. I think it's a great thing that we have in this town. <clears throat> it, the demographics of our society where things are changing, it's very common to have a divorced son or divorced daughter with one child, two ch children. And when you lay it out, you put these numbers together, 750 or nine, it makes a difference. And mm -hmm. you know, it might be the difference of having a comfortable set of stairs or, or an extra bathroom you know, a bedroom for your child, a boy and a bedroom for a daughter. <clears throat> it's a great thing you know, that we have it here in situation. We've had it for a long time. It's never really been abused, but I've known of. You know, the commercial application I can see is different. You know, mm -hmm. but usually when people spend, I'm in the construction business, so I do talk to people about this. It's usually the parent, you know, the mother or father. They don't want them in a nursing home. It's a good thing. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> when I look at the square footage, I just wonder, uh, you know, when you hit a number like that, and it, if it just so happens, it makes sense to be 25 more square feet. You know, so when I look at it going to 900, you know, sometimes 950 might be the difference. And, and I've seen that situation, you know, where you're just looking to make something work, and gee, it doesn't work. So that's why I'm asking, it has been 
problems. I understand yet that it must be a problem. The, the problem really was when people are putting these on very small houses. So you can have a house that's eight, under the old law, you could have a house that was 800 square feet and you could put a 750 square foot right. accessory on it and it doesn't look accessory necessarily and it's almost the same size as the main house and it just was never the intent of this provision to allow people to create something that looks like a duplex that, you know so if you're good so we took that and now I'm turning it into the lesser of you know those numbers to, so if you have a small house it's going to make the accessory smaller yeah. by comparison so it, so it hasn't been abused it's just it's not the right result and we've seen that happen a few times recently when you be discussing this again before the meeting the meeting we, we discussed it the last two or three meetings here and this is sort of the final step it's going to go on the town warrant and it's going on the up for vote at the town meeting and so this is the opportunity for anybody to okay. so speak up is, if they don't like what we've come up with prior, and then based on this the board will vote whether to go forward with it at, at an annual town meeting and then a town meeting will be your the, the, the vote it up or down vote the change up or down. yeah this is the language that the, this board came up with after about three meetings together working through the language so this is sort of the, you know a chance for anybody to point out something they really hate about it <laughs> well and we did actually talk about certain size lots but we thought that was going to be very complicated so in the case of like the garden road example we were saying oh well maybe that that restriction of the square footage is only for this size of lot but well, it, I, I didn't but <laughs> well we discussed it excuse I, well, me yeah. yeah I know right yeah <laughs> and, and the reality is we, we have to draw the line somewhere yeah and, you know, and, and so, someone's going to be unhappy with the line no matter what we do so we just pick out the, the best line that we thought, and sometimes the line that nobody likes is the best. Yeah. I mean, if it's 950 for one example, it may be 975 for the next no, one. No, I know. You see, 900 is not that big. Really. Yeah. You know, it, it, when we talk numbers, and 900 is not that big. It, right. It's actually more liberal than the towns around us. We surveyed the towns around us, Marshfield and Glass and other places, and um, I, I actually personally was trying to get it to be more restrictive than this, but we had to compromise as a board to come up with something that we could all agree upon, but um, this provision is much more liberal than all the towns around us well, by a big stretch. Maybe, maybe they should be looking what Sitchman does. Right? Well, maybe. I mean, that's what, yeah, you could argue that certainly. Uh, because 900, when you do, it's, you know, not that big. And it's like you're relegating someone to 900. If, if you have a bond, which this town is full of, that can be turned into accessory dwellings when someone, first of all, people don't do it unless they can afford it. Well, the last one we had in was about, I think, 750 square feet. It yeah. was two bedrooms, a living room, a kitchen. It had plenty of room. It was, you know, it's a good size apartment in two bedrooms. So it's not, you know, it was by no means small. Yeah. So, I mean, I think 900 is generous for something that's meant to be an apartment. Right, and, and accessory. It's 30 by 30. Yeah. Which is, which is. I mean, if you had a second level for that. <coughs> if you have if you're 20 by 30 or 20 by 20, 400 square feet, that would meet the 900. 20 by 30 is not that large. Uh, it's basically a living room, a decent bathroom, and a kitchen. And then two <laughs> no, bedrooms I above don't. it, you get right up there. Right, but it's meant to be an apartment. It's not meant to be a house. Right. This, well, is, this is an attached to a house, you know, or next it's to a house. So. You know, it's, it's been mm -hmm. around since 1982, and I've seen it many times. I see it many times. It's, it's not necessarily designed just to be a little apartment. You know, if you have, if you have a family of three, single parent with two children, it's not a lot of space. It's, it really isn't. So I'm, I'm a little reserved in the 900. You know, 1,200 is not huge, but I think 900 could be a bit restrictive. That's my point. You know, it's like husband and wife, 900 square feet, it's not a lot. You know? A lot of times people are, it's the parent coming to live with their, their children, or perhaps it's the other way around. I think the square footage is something to consider. You know, I, I, if I had known, I'm sorry to come in at this late stage when you've already discussed it three times, because I would actually lay out some plans to see what it means. But once you go to the second level, 30 by 30 on the first floor, that's fine. But generally, you're going up because you don't have that much ground space. We appreciate the comment. We spent a lot of time looking at this issue. We had plans of other units. We've looked at them over the years, and we did a survey of all the towns around us, and 900 is about 250 or 150 square feet more than any other town around us. I um, think some of the other language is that the accessory dwelling should be subordinate to the main dwelling. Uh, but 
it seems to me you're describing something that might look more like two houses on a single lot. Right, I am. You know, it's like um, there are many barns or outbuildings in the township. Presumably, that's a larger lot, though. I mean, we, yeah. the cases that we sort of looked at had perhaps small lots, maybe even non-conforming lots. Right. You know, if you want to start tying this to lot size, and we discussed that, um, for a 20,000 or 40,000 square foot lot, it might in fact be a different situation. But we felt that got too complex. You know, there's a chance to um, amend this again, obviously. We've just amended it um, for this year's town meeting right. for the vote. And um, yeah, that's why I mentioned it. Last year I thought it was a great progressive move. I thought it was very good. And it's a year later we're, we're adjusting it. Uh, based on what I understand, I'm not opposed to the other things where someone acknowledges that they're living there, and, you know, it's not a big deal. Mm -hmm. Just I, I do question on the square footage. It, it, it's, it's not arbitrary, but it just may be restricted. You know, if a person has a 3,000 square foot home, 1,200 square feet is not, not disproportionate. And 1,200 square feet would be basically maybe a 20 by 30 garage, you know, barn or something, two mm -hmm. levels. Two but levels. It goes back to how you count the square footage. If you're counting it by living space, which is seven foot one in height, <coughs> you know, it's not so problematic. Mm -hmm. As I said, I think we needed to put put a number out there, and I think this is in terms of our discussion, the previous discussions, and what's available around the joining towns, and that, that seemed to make sense to us. So, okay. but your point is well made. Thanks. Appreciate Anyone else? Comments. Stephen. I'm going to try and bring up just two points on this, and then I'm going to bite my lip. <laughs> Uh, transfer of ownership. The comment was made that we don't have to apply for new special permits. I'm wondering if a board member can tell me in section 530.4 and it says a special permit for accessory dwelling shall terminate upon the sale of and the new owner shall apply for a new permit, how we can constitute that that's not a new permit. Um, to me, it's certainly worded that way. It, it is a new permit. Maybe we misspoke. You have to apply for a new special permit if you sell the dwelling. See, that's the problem. Right. But uh, that's only one point, though. Yeah. But that was always in place, that, right? That needs to be corrected. Um, why does that need to be corrected? I don't understand why it needs to be corrected. <laughs> in, well, <laughs> anybody who has an accessory dwelling now, if they sell the house, no bank is going to finance the sale of an apartment that's now illegal that, if they sell the property. That, that's why we added the provision in at the end. And, and in fact, this tracks what Marshfield has, other than we made it more generous, where we allowed you to come in before the transfer and get it taken care of. So. Okay, so in section... And this is not dissimilar to most other towns that we looked at, Steve. 530.2, tell me how there's no conflict where it says an application for accessory dwelling shall be the fee owner or the owners of a detached single family dwelling on which the lot is located. You're not a fee owner if you have it under purchase and sales agreement. So that section should be changed to match the other section. Which, which section are you reading under 530.2A. Says you have to be the fee owner. Because, because you know, Steve, if you look at if you look at 530.4a. No, I'm looking at 530.2. I saw that. If you look okay. at 530.4a, it says that you can apply ahead of time, but it only becomes effective after the transfer of ownership is completed. But this says you can't apply unless you're the fee owner of the property. So it shouldn't say fee owner. It should say have the property under purchase and sales agreement and or be the fee owner in order not to be I, I think, the other section. I think we would still want the fee owner to apply for it. They have control of the property, so I don't think. The fee, so the fee owner is going to apply for a permit for someone who's going to buy the house before they sell the house, and then when they sell the house, the permit becomes no good. It doesn't work. Um, Wouldn't it be similar to getting a Title V you approval? Have a purchase and sales agreement on a property, apply for the permit, get the approval from the planning board before they buy the property so that a bank will actually finance the sale. So somehow that's got to get worded in there. I don't know. So, if we, right. so we just said in 530.2a, if we just say or a that proposed helps. transferee under section 530.4a. Anybody who's got a, you can't say fee owner, anybody who's got the property under agreement should be able to file for a permit. And that's the way it is now. Oh. I mean, whether it's with any type of permit in town. So he's just kind of just cross-referencing it. It's fine. Sure. Yeah. yeah. They just conflict. That's all. Just say, just uh, say or under, you know, or. or, or a, Proposed new owner under Section 530.4A. 
What about a Title V approval, Steve? If I've got, if I'm selling, I've got to get that in place before I can sell, right? It's not the new owner that gets that; it's the seller. Right, but that's not what this says. No, no, but I mean, you could do it if that you're way. You're saying that you want a new seller to uh, to reump the permit before he sells the property. Yeah. There's no reason to do that. What you're really trying to do is get the new owner to come in to comply with. Yeah. Permit. Okay. So it's just a cross reference. Yeah. Okay. The new owner comes in. Mm -hmm. it's so we'll say, so we'll, we'll, what yeah. we'll do is we'll, we'll reword 530.2a to come back up as, to mm -hmm. reference 530.4a. Yeah, it's just a language change. It's not a substantive change from what we intend. It's just no, a it's clarification. It's the crafting one, that's all. Yeah, sure. Yeah. But I would like to tie on to that for 530.4 for my conversation. Special permit for accessory dwelling shall terminate upon the sale of or the transfer of title of primary dwelling. My question is why? Why? Because we're issuing a new permit to the new owner, and the new owner then has obligation to submit the annual certification. That's why you have to have it as a new permit. Why have it? Why have it terminate? I mean, because that's how. Because that's how you. Have it here that every year you have to do something. To it's a it's a check to make sure that when the property transfers they're actually complying with the requirements to be qualified to have an accessory dwelling and a lot of other towns use this because if it doesn't happen what happens frequently is that it gets transferred and they ignore this and they they really don't qualify for it because it's not owner occupied so this is a common I looked at probably a dozen communities that have this exact same provision I and it's a check to make sure that they comply with what they're supposed to I think you're putting a big burden on the people because a buyer's going to if I would want to know for a fact that I'm buying a property that, that I don't have to come back in. You may not be here. It may be a completely different board. And they may not understand what you're thinking. They may, they may, think, they may think differently. You're thinking just so that it doesn't become a rental property completely, which I'm not sure that's happened in the town of Citroen. I think, I think this is unnecessary. I'm afraid of this. Special permit for an accessory dwelling shall terminate upon the sale or transfer of the title of the primary dwelling, accessory dwelling on the lot. Any, any new owner shall be required to apply for a new approval of a special permit for accessory dwelling for continuation of the use of accessory dwelling. Is that, do they come before the ZDA? Do they go to the town hall? It's all us. It's the planning board. Uh, they come here. They, they come file for a whole new permit. What, but mm -hmm. why? Yeah. What would be the logic of that? The logic is it's the best time to check to make sure it's owner occupied. And it's been shown in other cases in other towns around the state that when that's not done, um, these do turn into rental properties quite frequently. So that's yeah, the best time to check it. I don't know. I, I think this is over bureaucratic. You know, it's like if I come in and I get a permit from you and I spend three months and I come here and I, or I hire a lawyer or something, and I come in and I do that, and then I leave, I have that permit, whatever that might be. That's the process here at town. If someone goes through and gets an accessory dwelling and they sell that property or transfer it to their family member, why should they have to come back in? Well, the, apply? the complaints, up, the excuse me, it sets up the process that we've, that we've talked about where you come back up and you make the annual certification. But don't they have to do that anyway? Didn't we say they have to do an annual certification? And, and that's what this does, this set that, make sure that person knows is a buyer of the property that he has to come back and do that. But but if I understand correctly, and this is the first time I saw this because I got this information offline, this wasn't online, but if I have an accessory dwelling annually now, the new policy is going to be I have to verify that I'm an owner occupied. Yes. Mm -hmm. That does it. So if I want to sell it to this gentleman here, why should he have to come in and reapply to <coughs> be to have it? It's a ham it's a hammer. It doesn't get done frequently. It's a hammer to say that when it's like Title V, you know, when you go to transfer the property, that's the best time that the state can check to make sure you're complying. Same concept. I think, I think it's, it's, it's kind of scary. Well, if I buy a property from Dan that has, he's got the permit, he's got the accessory dwelling, and I buy it, let's say we don't have this provision, then it's like, yeah, I'm supposed to come in to the planning board, but it's like, I didn't sign any documents. I, it's not, I mean, there's a but, permit uh, there. It's already in your chain of title, code. so you have to comply with the chain of title if it's a special permit for the property. We do this with conservation orders and conditions mm -hmm. all the time. When you train, there's a condition mm -hmm. in every order of conditions in the town of Situate that says when you sell your property, you have to notify the conservation commission of the change of ownership. And that may be a better way to do this 
that when you sell your property, they, the special permit's already on record, so it's on record in perpetuity. If they do a transfer, an attorney picks that up at the clo uh, closing or before the closing, they would have to notify Laura or whoever of the planning board <coughs> that there's been a transfer of property. And if she wanted to draft a letter out that said, make sure you adhere to these provisions, you have to make sure that it's owner-occupied, that can be done without nullifying the special permit. So there is a way, I mean, again, we do that with the orders and conditions all, all the time, every week. You would hope the seller or the realtor would make the new buyer aware of that early in the process Correct. so that they know what they're buying. Correct, and it is in the chain of title. Once it's on record, that's it. You can't take it off record. So it is in record. You know, it's on record with a condition that you guys would have on the special permit that says it has to be owner-occupied. So anybody buying that that doesn't adhere to that permit, you then could turn around and certainly take away the permit and say, this is not owner-occupied, you're in violation <coughs> of the special permit, and you could haul them back in again. Without making everyone have to come back in to get a new permit every time there's a transfer of ownership. The, the problem is it's a question of enforcement. I mean, the reality is you do systems like that, it just doesn't get enforced and nobody pays attention to it. So, I mean, this is, this is intended to be onerous and intended to catch the attention of people when they buy a property to say, wow, I need to pay attention to this and I need to certify it and make sure it's owner-occupied. And the problems we've had in town have not been, this is overly bureaucratic, even if this is a new change. It's been neighborhoods um, having problems with losing their character and people taking advantage of it. So. That's what the balance is here. It's not, you know, is 900 not enough and it's gonna cause somebody heartache? It's no, is, is, are we setting a reasonable restriction on the square footage to protect the character of neighborhoods? Well, That's I what this no is all the about. Square foot. The square footage, I think, and actually works pretty good. It, I, I do, sorry, but I, I do, know, I agree know. that the character of these is to be small housekeeping units. Yeah. So I fully agree with the board. I think your numbers are reasonably accurate. Yeah, there's gonna be some cases when maybe they should have been bigger if it's a big mansion out in the West End and somebody wanted 1,200 square feet, probably wouldn't be a detriment to the neighborhood, but I certainly understand the problem these people have when you're in an area with 900 square foot houses and they want to put a 750 square foot apartment. That is a change in character in the neighborhood. But that being said, those have to go to the Zoning Board of Appeals because they're pre-existing non-conforming, the dwellings, and if you increase them more than 20% in situ, you need to get a special permit from the zoning board that says you're not substantially more detrimental to the neighborhoods. So if I were you, I would be watching for the zoning yeah. board of appeals. Yeah. 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 Did we they talk. determine that it was not detrimental? It's not going to apply. Who's not going to apply? It's well, we can talk after. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but they do. We looked into that. We heard on it. Technically, if it's greater than Section a 20% yes. increase, it has to go but to the zoning I, board. As, as a person who's affected in this neighborhood, I am very comforted by knowing that a new owner is made very aware before they buy the property that not only is it on their deed, but every year they gotta get their butt down here to sign something and say, yes, I am owner occupied, because though I can guarantee you that it, within a couple of years, we're gonna have two pieces of property. Okay. I, 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 I think this. If I can, through the chair, <coughs> I, I, I totally agree with what she just said, and to clarify that, you will still have the provision that they have to come in once a year to make sure that it's owner occupied, and they will still have the restriction that says when that's changed on record that it has to be an owner occupant that's purchasing it. I'm assuming that their problem is not who this person is gonna sell that to in the future, it's that whoever owns that house complies with being owner occupied. See, we wanna the see them though. We want them to come to us when it changes ownership. We don't want them just to submit a form or forget to submit one and five years go by and then we get a complaint from a neighbor. There's a new owner, we wanna see them. We want them to come into us and prove to us that it's gonna be owner occupied and that, that's the point. If they're not reading the permit, why would they come anyway? Well, maybe they won't, but then they don't have a permit and if we catch them, then they won't be able to occupy it, so. Yeah. So they're not going to get the permit later on. I mean, that's, if they're not going to read the permit that says they have to be owner occupied, they're certainly not going to get it. If they get an, if they have a good attorney, they'll point that you know they'll catch this. Perfect. Some people won't. And they will make sure it's owner occupied. That, that's the only point. But right. the, the, yeah. the second point that I had, and it's, this is the last one I'm going to hold it to. Um, are we <laughs> no longer going to allow accessory dwellings in the business we district? We are. We just moved it to a different section. We moved it to the village overlay So it's section. not allowed in the business district? It is allowed. Only the village overlay district? Uh, well, yeah, but that's all the business yeah. districts except for one or two parcels. I think it's one parcel in Greenbush and Humrock. It, 
doesn't include those two areas or the North Situate area. Okay, and, uh, and, I, and what, I'm reading, what I'm reading, again, I apologize because it, as, as uh, what happened here, I just picked this up when I walked in the door, and I'm kind of thumbing through it fast, and I apologize because I was going to try and do this ahead of time. Uh, you've got to, you have, there's another conflict. I'm assuming that you, in your area that talks about allowing these things in businesses, you don't intend to conflict with the definition of an accessory dwelling because you're only allowing them in single family dwellings based on the definition uh, an accessory dwelling has to be in a single family structure. So I'm sure that that probably needs to be wordsmithed a little bit to include businesses if you'd like to have that. Okay, that's in businesses. Yeah. Sure. Mm -hmm. Good There's point. Some people yeah. in the room that might appreciate these in business districts in something other than Absolutely. a single family dwelling. Yeah. yeah. Yep, that's a good catch. And, good. And I don't know what else I'm going to find in this. I apologize, but it, I mean, it's it's got some holes in it. And I want to tie on to that uh, 530.4. There's a lot of work done here, as Steve had mentioned, on the waterfront, it's conservation. They have regulations. They have regulations. And I appreciate you telling me that, but, yes. but I'm sitting in a different, you know. But why? What's the objective here? The objective is to come back up and to make sure that I don't end up with what starts out as an accessory dwelling that ended up being multiple units on the, on the lot, uh, period. Okay, I hear you. Then, and I want to say, uh, if you want people to come up here, you want a person to sell their home and tell their buyer, you're going to have to go down and apply, and they can't guarantee that they're going to be approved. If you're no guarantee. You have to go in. They can say, well, you should be approved, but the next board members may not think the way you're thinking. You just want to make sure it's on occupied. But the next board members may say, just like Laura said, it isn't that long. It hasn't been around that long. It has been around that long. But, but I, I, you, you don't make zoning in, in, in kind of what may happen in the future. You look correct. at it correct. You look at it with what, That's correct. What, what the issue is right now. And, and you look to address that particular issue or issues. And correct. So <laughs> and that's, this is the way that we've opted to do that. I agree. What you're saying is, <coughs> in fear of future people selling these properties and renting them both out, the odds of that are very low. But I think we have enough enforcement with it registered at the Registry of Deeds. Everything that goes to conservation, that's how it's policed. Okay. Your point's understood. But how do we, how do we get, how do we influence a change? We don't. We don't. We've already agreed to this. So. And I don't think we agree with your perspective. So. What, what, what we want is we want a personal commitment between the board and each successive owner that they're going to play by the rules. We want to look in their eyes. We want them to look in our eyes and make sure we have a meeting of the minds on that issue. And that's, that's what we, we want. That's how we protect the neighborhoods. And we have had some problems. Basically, so. basically you, I think you're taking the perspective that people with these properties are not uh, honest or upright. That's not the case. That is not the case. That is not the case. Well, who else has to come down and prove that the to we, we, we just want to make sure that people understand what they're getting themselves into and that there's no, no issues and no uncertainty in anybody's mind. It's actually a protection for the buyers as well when they come into it, having something heavy-handed like this that they know what's required of them. And if you don't have something like this, yeah. You're using the word heavy-handed. There's not. meant to be heavy-handed. It's meant to be a hammer to force people to comply with what we expect. It is. I don't understand why it is. <laughs> we should move on to something else. Yeah, I, mm -hmm. but, you know, I'm at Nancy Larkham at 33. No, I'm 38. at 38. <laughs> oh, God, 38. <laughs> you know, first of all, I want to thank you for um, quantifying the word um, subordinate. That, that was really good to see. Very happy about that. Um, I, I will just speak to this gentleman because it was so important 
through the process that the person sat here and heard the board say, you must live there, because we had every reason to believe that the person did not have an intention to live there. So once they do that, though, it's impossible to change it. Once that building is there and those two units are rented, we have no recourse. So if it doesn't happen at the time, that they don't look them in the eye and say, you have to live there, do you understand? For a neighborhood that felt very comfortable for us, that this person who's going to be moving into this house knows that she has to live there. And if the house is sold, okay. they should have the same interaction. And you jump through a thousand hoops when you sell a house. This is just one tiny one in the process. So, but thank you in the, in the book. I think we've got it. I, I, let's, let's agree to disagree on that. Do we have anything else, Stephen? I just wanted to say, again, the protection is there because the permit has a condition that the owner has to live in the house. So don't, don't say there's no protection. If you find out, and it's not gonna be self-regulating, it's gonna be neighborhood regulating. So if you find out the owner's not there, who's gonna call the town hall? It's not gonna be the owner. It's not gonna be these guys, because they don't live in the neighborhood. It's gonna be the neighbors are gonna come in and say, hey, that person bought that house, and they're renting it as a two-family, and they don't live there. Mm -hmm. And Laura is gonna be the first one to send them a letter saying you're in violation of your special permits on re registry of deeds. That's how it's going to get regulated, and if they terminate the permit, then they'll have to come back in and prove that they are living there. So there are protections that we've had since the bylaw was out. That's I, actually I, I really just have to clarify that I have been told by the building department multiple times that I do not have the authority to enforce special permits, and that I don't have the authority to go on private property. So in that case, I don't have the authority to enforce. Okay, he does. Okay. But that's another department. But that's another. They have a whole other bunch of issues. But, but it, the ability to enforce it is within the town hall. Yeah. Yeah. There's only options. In theory, but you know, practically speaking, it's a whole different thing. Okay. So. Okay. Are there any other points that we want to talk about? Not tonight. Good through two. <laughs> I just want to reiterate what she said. We were so grateful that. Um, that you're, you're changing it so this doesn't happen to any other neighborhood. Um, and I, I watched your meeting the 12-2012. It was fascinating um, where you, maybe it was the second reading, I don't know, but um, the discussion was interesting and I, I have a question about why two things were eliminated since then in the final draft. One is, is that, and I looked at Cohasset and Mount Marshfield both, I looked up their codes, and they both have a provision that if you build a new house, you can't apply for an accessory dwelling for three to ten years. Three years in um, Marshfield, ten years in Cohasset. Mm -hmm. That's so that people aren't building new houses that already contain rental property. Um, and, and as a an person in a neighborhood, uh, s small lots, um, I think that's really important, and I wondered why you left it out. And is I, it I agree with you. Back well, in? Well, I agree with you, but I, I lost on perhaps the I, I, perhaps I can address that, and it, it's simply to cover those instances where um, a family and perhaps in-laws come in together and decide to purchase a home together or build a home together, with the idea that right from the very beginning there will be an accessory dwelling for another household that are still family members. Uh, oftentimes we see, uh, I, I know personally I've observed, um, you know, a, a family with children will come in and buy a house or build a house and then somebody's parents or grandparents will come in as part of the deal and help fund the, the construction of that and, 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 and as, as that construction they want to have a, an accessory dwelling for the grandparents to live. So all of these contingencies apply to new construction as well? Like, yes. Yeah. So they would still, if they, on our little lots, if they built the 1,200 square foot house, they could only build the 400. Yes, square. correct. Yes. Mm -hmm. but, but isn't that building for two families, isn't that a multi-family home? When you intentionally know that another family, uh, uh, a son and daughter and two children are going to move uh, in? Uh, let me, let me, let me give you well, anyway, so let me give you my example, okay? okay. And my my mother-in-law is 93, okay? and would love to have her live with us, but she's currently in Texas and enjoys Texas. But to the extent that she was to come up and live with me and for me to put an accessory dwelling on it, right, I have the inability because of my lot, the way, location and everything else to come back up and put an addition on my house. Yeah. Okay, so I can't do it. So the only choice for me to do it would be to buy a, or build a new house and then come back up and put that accessory dwelling within that new house. And if I had to wait 10 years, 
But in all deference, I live in a thousand square feet. I bought that house and knew that. I knew I never could move my father in when my mother died. Yeah. I just knew I couldn't do it. So, I mean, I understand that, but it's, well, well we could. You'd give him the second bedroom. He'd live right with you. Or, or you'd sell house. that house and build a new one. And you could buy a used uh, house. I'd have to buy a new, I would have to buy another house. I couldn't do right. it on my 5,000 square right. foot lot with 1,000 right. square foot. Just the way Bill lot. can't do it on his. And I can't do it on mine. So you would have to buy, have to buy two or two. Well, I would have to buy a house that either has, a, has a, right. an accessory dwelling in it. Yeah, I don't see or, that as a problem. Or I'd have to come up and create it. Or and what you're doing is precluding for me by building a new house that has that has the accessory yeah, dwelling I in it. Have the money to well, you could buy a used house and build an accessory yes. dwelling. Yeah, yeah. You're, I do that. All it precludes <laughs> is building a brand new house with a brand yeah. new accessory dwelling. That's Which all it precludes. It seems like a multifamily house. If you intentionally build a house with two separate mm -hmm. living spaces, no matter if it's for one person or four people, by let's anyway, let's take let's point. let's take the other end of the spectrum as perhaps an absurd example. But suppose I want to build, maybe not in situate, maybe in Cohasset, uh, a very large house, and I want to have um, an au pair, or I want to have several. Uh, I want to have a, a husband and wife who are cook <laughs> and uh, and butler gardener yeah. live there You're not on within the house. Feet, no, um, we, we didn't tie this to lot size, remember? Yeah, that's, yeah, I, I understand so that. So now, yeah. you know, you need an accessory dwelling within that new house. See, they have a big enough lot to do that. <laughs> that uh, I just want to say this one last thing. <laughs> I've well, seen, has been like like for 10 years. <laughs> the accessory dwelling isn't for people to sneak in to rent out both houses. People don't do that. Well, and, and maybe it'll happen in this situation. Many, okay. How do you know it's maybe. not happening now? Yeah. Well, let me say this. Wait a minute. Let's, let's go through the, the chair. cases, it doesn't happen. You know, when someone does something like this, it's probably costing them 100 grand. People are not looking for a way to circumvent the code in situate so they could have two rentals. If they want to have two rentals, they can go buy two rentals somewhere else. It's, you know, if you're just looking for an investment, where you're talking about is perhaps someone moves out and it gets rented for whatever crazy reason and they've got them both rented. Okay, understood. But they're not in conforming, conformance with the special permit. And I, I don't see why they have to come in and reapply. You know, I really don't. I, think, I thought we just closed that out. Say, you know, <laughs> uh, that, that, dead, that dead horse is complaining. Yeah, yeah I think we've, we've kind of plowed that ground. Okay. <coughs> I'm tell you that I, I respectively disagree with the concept because I think you're getting the wrong perspective. It's not for people to circumvent, it's for people to provide. I'm, I'm pretty sure we understand both okay. your point and your logic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, okay. So the question, well, um, I just wondered why Cohasset and Marshfield both have that contingency if it's something that you think is not valuable. Um, so I just put my two cents in on that. And the other thing is I loved your idea of shared parking because the, the house we, the um, on Fay Avenue or Fay Road or whatever it is, we showed you a couple of accessory dwelling the, and it was shared parking, so it didn't look like a duplex like the property in our street's going to look. And um, you talked about that. I love that idea, the, the shared parking. And then why do you need to have two cars for a, uh, you know, an accessory dwelling? You know, and, and both Cohasset and Marshfield say one off-street parking space, not two. Mm -hmm. you know, and you can do shared parking, and then it doesn't. And they also are very clear that it should not that it should look like a single family dwelling. And with the two driveways, the two entrances and all that, definitely not gonna look like a single family dwelling. Um, so I wondered why you also took that out. Cause I thought that was a great idea. I, I can tell you it was sort of a lesson in compromise for me cause the first draft I put together had all of that in it. And I, I think that, you know, everybody has a different perspective on the board and to come together to get something at all to pass, you know, I had to give up a lot of those things along the way. You know, I think the nice thing, what we're left with, you know, still is a significant improvement. Yes, absolutely. absolutely, we agree. Especially with that. the square footage piece is huge yeah, totally. for the town. Yeah. So, so I think, yeah. you know, there's a lot of little things along the way that I, I think may or may not be good ideas. But I think at the end of the day, the board sort of, I don't want to speak for everybody, but sort of felt like people still have to come in front of us. So, as you saw with the, the Garden Road one near you, we did, you know, have the ability to put some additional requirements on it as we kind of saw fit to make it reasonable. So it wouldn't prohibit us from putting that on it later as a board. It just wouldn't require it. Um, I prefer for it to be required. Others wouldn't, but you know, we still have well, some. You might have to say they have to do shared 
We, we could. We, we still have some room to put conditions on a permit, and so we still have that ability. It's just not an absolute requirement on a lot of those things. Oh, well, on, on that point with a single-family home, yeah. you could have two driveways anyway. I mean, really? If I have a single-family home, I could have two driveways. But I think the, the way we've compromised, I guess, is, is basically sitting there saying it's a special permit, so we can come back up and say it's a shared driveway, it's two driveways, it can be what, however we want it to be. And by making a special permit, we can, we can specify that. Well, the last thing I want to ask is how can we support you um, in April? Do you want us to bring the neighborhood? I mean, we can. <laughs> sure. More, we made lots of friends. You know, that, 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 would, that, would be, that would be very nice. Okay, yes. Yes. bring yes. lots of people. Okay. To and be the supportive issue of perhaps where the support is needed is to get it past the town meeting. Uh, okay. okay. Bring two That's where. Of the town to vote in favor of <laughs> That's That's a miracle. Yeah. We'll, we'll, bring, we'll bring the people in our neighborhood. Oh, we'll just we'll make sure people know about it and yeah. uh, try to get them there. Well, and we it's want to support with, you. With still having issues. Thanks. I, I mean, I think you can anticipate at town meeting there's going to be people there that will try to defeat this and or try to amend it to the point that it's ineffective in some cases. So, you know, and that happens at every town meeting. There's some of that there. So we do need, you know, if you're in favor of it, you need to show up and yeah. and get up, be willing to get up to the microphone and talk if need be and convince people that this is a big improvement over, you know, what we had before based hey, on we'll personal experience. Yeah. <laughs> if, so if it doesn't pass <coughs> in the general town meeting, everything reverts back to the existing Stays the way it is. Now. Right. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Correct. Yep. You know, you know and, the, and the, another thing to consider is that uh, there's nothing stopping us as the years go on and we see issues arise that we, cannot, we can't further amend it and fix the problems that we see. Okay. But we, but we need to fix what we've got. We've got to start somewhere. Yeah, and we appreciate it greatly, well, really. I, I you restored my faith in situate. <laughs> I'm sorry that it needed to be restored. I love this place. Yeah. <laughs> I love this place. And, and I was um, crushed. But I, I, I appreciate that you're trying to, you, you realize that there was something wrong with that and that you want to, you know, make it better. And, and that's the kind of town I want to live in. I Great. could love to listen to you talk all night, but we've got to move on. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to say everything yeah. about that. Especially when well, you're saying nice things and, about yeah, us. That's I great. I just, don't go on. I just wanted to add one <laughs> refreshing, <laughs> actually. If I may, Bill, just one real quick comment is that, you know, I think probably 90% of the people aren't going to really understand the language. Maybe not. I'll say 80%. Or care. Or care. So to, to give a real-world example and to make it sort of simple, it would be, I think, very powerful. That's all I wanted to say. We can do that. Okay. Anything else on accessory dwelling? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. You're welcome. Thank you. Thanks for coming in. Yeah, yeah. appreciate it. Um, so I think we've come back up and we've got two changes, as I understand it. One is under accessory dwelling, the definition, we've got to add business to it. Yep. Yeah. So we need to change that. And then the second thing is under. 530.2A, do we want to come back up and make a reference, add a reference to um, yeah. 530.4.A? It'll say like an applicant shall be the fee owner or owners or or the... Um, or as defined in... Or the um, proposed new owner under section 530.4A. Or we could just in the uh, special permit section make a reference in there and say something like notwithstanding the requirements of the general the general requirement for this specific one you don't have to, you don't have to be the fee owner until actually you do it that sounds more confusing than just adding a reference <laughs> to five whatever three. you want to do is fine i don't want to get in the middle between two lawyers but it sounds to me like it's straightforward to say or or is referenced in 530.4.a Reminds me of the in 534A, you're talking about a new owner proposed, be to right? And you can so come in a proposed sure proposed new owner. Yeah. Yeah. Ways from um, 530.2A. Right. Okay. Yeah, because we say you're not the owner yet. You're a proposed, you're a proposed owner. owner. Oh, and also I see a typo in 530.4A. I just noticed. Oh, the extra little dot there at the end. Well, there's. Uh, yeah, I saw the dot, but at 530.4A, about one, two, three, four, five lines up. It says in connection with any proposed transfer to a new owner, the propose instead of proposed new owner. Okay, well, this is a really good time for everybody to be reading and getting their, um, 
really good glasses out and let me know if there are any other little changes or typos or anything like that. And, and I would say, when I, you've I know at yourself 10 times, you know, the 11th time you don't see anything. Yeah. Sure. Well, I know Steve is going to scrutinize this, and if you find any more like inconsistencies or typos or anything, give them to Laura and we can, you know, if we need to, if it makes sense, if it's, you know, making the language work better. Yeah. We can. Yeah, do we need sneak that in. Okay. Do we need a motion to vote this with the changes to recommend it? How many? Well, what uh, what we did was we put all the articles together in one vote. But um, if you want to just vote this one, we can do that. When I just soon vote them and close them out individually. Okay. We we had like a, a bet going on that, and I lost. So. <laughs> <laughs> the pool. Huh? So you're not going to Vegas. So I'm not going to Vegas. Over under. I can just say the one. I don't want to see the planning board implicit in some sort of gambling operation. Yeah. Yeah. Take out the, the medical marijuana and the uh, village business and everything else that doesn't relate. Okay, so we're, but we are closing the public hearing on the um, accessory. accessory dwellings, right? Okay. Well, the public hearing is really on all four, so I think just skip over that part about the public hearing and just go. Um, I, I, I move, move to adopt. The planning board make a recommendation. That the annual town meeting. You know what? I think we better do it all at the end then, right? It, did, was it advertised okay. as a public hearing for all four? Yeah. Okay. We should do it all at the yeah. end. Then. Okay. We better. Okay. Because okay. somebody could show up. We'll, and we'll remember to make yeah. sure you guys vote. We get people. <coughs> I think Chris, you're here for village overlay. <coughs> so let's do the village overlay next. Did you talk about that? Yeah, the working backwards. <coughs> What we've got is, as I identified before, that the bylaw is the same as the one that was published in the, the legal ad. It's the same one that's been available both at the town hall and with the town clerk's office. This is what we're doing. We're amending the zoning bylaw to replace the final section of the sentence of section 560.4 requirements for mixed use with the following language. Frontage requirements in the underlying zoning dis district or districts <coughs> may be reduced by a vote of four out of the five members of the planning board. As long as the existing frontage is de determined to be adequate for traffic circulation within the site, traffic safety, parking, and access for the vehicular traffic expected to be generated by the use or uses on the site. The planning board may require a review by a traffic engineer or sim similarly qualified professional prior to making this determination. In accordance with Mass General Laws C41 and 53G, the <coughs> applicant may be required to deposit fees for the employment of such a traffic engineer or similar qualified professional, and any unexpected fees shall be returned to the applicant. In other cases where zoning re requirements are not specified, construction must meet the requirements of the underlying zoning district. Well, that is the change. Questions from the board? Comments from the board? Questions from the public? I hear none. Last chance? <laughs> okay. Hearing none, we'll move on to item number two, uh, which is a flexible open space development amended to the zoning bylaw. Here again, this is the one identical to what was placed in the legal ad, available both in the planning board and the town clerk's office. Amend is, what we're looking to do is amend the zoning bylaw, and the proposed changes consist of replacing 550-6A Minimum requirements for flexible open space development with the following language. A, lot area and lot width. Each lot shall be at least of a size and width in the opinion of the planning board, capable of supporting construction of a single or two family dwelling with accessory structures and an individual sewage septic system unless a viable alternative method of sewage disposal is proposed. So that is the change. Any questions or comments? Yeah, what's the change? adding width. Adding lot width to one of the things that you can change in the uh, flexible open space from what's required. Neil Duggan had requested this so that um, everything was, was really spelled out about everything that could be buried in the flexible open space. Yeah, because there is no lot width requirement in the flexible open space. No. Mm -hmm. it would, it also he says, wanted it to be spelled out. He had asked us to put it in. We, we've agreed to do it. 
Can you? No, effectively, it doesn't. I mean, because it's not spelled out as a requirement, but what it does is it says that it can be, a, it, it's, it looks at the lot and sits there and says the planning board make a determination both the size and the width. That's all. Okay. No questions at all? That brings us to the one everybody is here for, and that's the medical marijuana use regulations. Can I just ask, going back to the uh, oh, I'm sorry, Chris, go ahead. The previous one, since there, you know, the board didn't have any questions, uh, that assumes the board will be supporting that uh, measure in the village over there. What we'll do is we have to vote at the end. We'll have to vote, but yeah. where, we, where we voted and supported up to now, I, I don't expect it to change. Okay. Thank you. Okay. You, I'm, I'm sorry? They wrote it this time. They wrote it this time. That's I just told you guys. Written things I don't support. Getting ready for the storm. Okay. So the last article Thank you. That we're going to discuss the public hearing is the medical marijuana use regulations. We're looking to amend the zoning bylaw. The proposed changes include putting in section 200 definitions, an addition of a definition for, medical, for a medical marijuana treatment center, and B, addition of the new section 491, which is a temporary moratorium on medical marijuana treatment centers, to provide for a moratorium on building permits and other approvals until May 1, 2014, projected to follow at the next annual town meeting to allow the town adequate time to consider how best to regulate facilities associated with the sale and or processing of marijuana for medical use. Comments? You board? Is, is anyone here to, to discuss it? Because <laughs> <laughs> I think we've pretty much talked about it at all the other meetings, but let me come back and s sit there and just give t two seconds worth of background on it. Situate is like the, the adjoining, adjoining towns. It's come back up and have been they're dependent upon the state, the State Department of Health to come back up and provide the regulations of which we would then come back up and be able to regulate the facilities. The state has not come forth with it. it, it I think in the article I read today, the late, latest article I read today, it ends up that the May 1st date, which it's due, uh, is, it looks like it's going to be unlikely for the state to come back up and comply with the, providing us regulations and requirements at that point in time. What this does is it there and says that it's, it identifies that what a center is, and, but it comes back and says that we'll put a moratorium out to the year 2014 until we've had adequate time to come back up, get the state regs, discuss the state regs, and figure out how best to handle it in, in the town of Sichuan. So that's the, the logic of what it is. We've reviewed it with. Uh, town council and the, the other powers that be in the, within the state, and this seems to be a logical approach that not only Situate but other towns are using. Any other comments? Any questions? So I have to find a real job for another year? <laughs> <laughs> if what was said in the Mariner, the way I understood it, you could be a warehouser. Because <laughs> they were talking about not having separate facilities, but the state being having control of all of them, they would have 35 warehouses, which would be owned and managed by the state. I don't, I don't personally understand why this can't be dispensed through pharmacies, the way Oxycontin and other, you know, drugs that perhaps have unwanted side effects are dispensed. I think it's the federal law issue and the, because yeah. I was looking into that today, in fact, I think it's not going to be, you know, done like in a pharmacy because those are all FDA-approved facilities, you know, with FDA-approved drugs, and it's well, still illegal that, federally. That should tell you something. Yeah, yeah. You think? it's still <laughs> illegal federally, so it can't be dispensed under a doesn't, licensed pharmacy. Doesn't that pharmacy. give you a hint yeah. of, of <laughs> some problem? It's interesting. Yeah. They're, they're all liable to DEA regulation. Yeah. So. yeah. Now we can have a motion. Mr. Chairman, could I just make... Sure. I, I don't necessarily want to reopen the issue of accessory dwellings, but listening to this gentleman, it seems to me it might be relatively easy to allay one fear of this reapplication by the new owner, and that would be to insert words to the effect that upon reapplication to the planning board by the new owner, such permit shall be granted by right so long as conditions of the original permit are adhered to. In other words, our intention is if you're going to continue to abide by the conditions of your deed, we're, we're absolutely not going to deny it or give you any problems. That sounds fine to me. That sounds great. It's clear, mm -hmm. takes the fear That's the intent of, the of it. So. Yes. It's yeah. still a new special permit? 
Sure. Well, the way you just said it, it would be still a new one. But yes, exactly. But basically, but you're giving the assurance right. mm -hmm. that saying you're you not, know. you know, you're not going to run yeah, into any you problems. As you met the conditions the, that existed when the original was developed, the original permit was granted. As long as that is not changed, then you would be entitled to it by right as a new permit. You'd have to make sure the accessory dwelling hasn't changed as well. Yeah. In that I time, wonder so. how you can say something is is going to be provided by right if it's a special permit. I yeah, mean, that's that kind of a well. Yeah, I, I don't know. I'm not an attorney. I mean, it just. <laughs> I, I want to assure that uh, anybody reading this oh, knows it that be unreasonably withheld or something like that. Uh, 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 even uh, that uh, is a little bit dicey. You know, I what's, a, what's unreasonable? I wonder if we could arrange to have those successive special permits processed administratively directly by your office without necessarily having to come back to the board. Well, it's you a know, question of teeth, you know, it either has no, teeth or it doesn't. I, I understand that. You know, that's... Um, you don't plug it has teeth. He's your zoning on the subject. <laughs> uh, <you> know, <laughs> I mean, the, it's like an <laughs> ANR lot, right? I mean, the other way it's to go... It's all the requirements of an ANR lot. we we got to grant... Yeah, we have to do we it. We have to grant it. The other way to go would be... This would be the uh, same Which thing. would require... Yeah, yeah, yeah wait, let's so. see. All right. The other way to go, which would, you know, I, I think we're so far down the process here, I don't know if we have time to do much more with it now, but... If we did have more time, which I'm not sure we do, the other way to go would be to say the original special permit will terminate unless the new owner comes in and provides, you know, evidence and all the affidavits and everything like that. Versus it does terminate upon, but um, that that provision came out of I think three other towns that had that exact same provision. So mm -hmm. it, it you know it's been thought through by other towns and they've worked with it and it's worked. Well, but yeah. but I can I can see how let, it let, could be better. Let, let's but. see how it works. You know, if we have okay. to fix it in successive years, we'll do it. But for right now, let's see how it works. Which one? The, the, as the it stands now. Yeah, we could always amend it. Is better, better of all of them. We could always amend oh, it. A confused mind is frightened. I'm frightened just listening to you guys. <laughs> you don't want to lose the whole bylaw over that issue, so I would think about it a little bit more before the night's over. If that's the one issue that's going to make or break it. It's not. <laughs> No, we have strong support for this yeah. from tons we of get, we, get the gar we get the Garden garden Road neighborhood in there and yeah. you know, haven't helped anybody who stands in that. opposition <laughs> to that. If it Just worried about if making it, it better. Pass, so. you know, that's a message. Yeah. Well, and, yeah. you know, we, we hear messages like everybody else. Okay. I, I think, Bob, your idea, it's, it's good, but it would need some work to make it work legally. Okay. You know, I Maybe. certainly accept that from an attorney. And I kind of feel like if we had more time, it would be worth looking into some more. But, of course, you can always, I mean, you can never have a perfect draft of a law. You keep going on and on and on we and on. But we've had, we we've had three hearings on it. And we we've had it. three hearings on it, and it is an example from other towns. So I, I kind of feel like at this point in the game, we should probably but, but, try but, to get it passed. But, and then if but, we need to Let's see how it works, and then we'll look at it again in the years to come. Yeah. When do you have to close the public hearing? Tonight. I think based on timing, right? No. It doesn't have to be tonight, but um, I mean, it, you know, it's always convenient to do it in one night, but it doesn't have to be tonight. We can continue it to the next meeting. Hmm. Leave that one open and close the rest of the, the, the library. Well, I, think, yeah, I think that doesn't. No, that's, that's not going to work either because we've tied them all together, together in terms of the public hearing. They were all advertised together, so. I mean, I'm, I'm not opposed to, to, to working on it. Resolving it. We could even bring an amendment if we wanted to up at the fall meeting, if it were you know yeah. some minor change. That but but I think for the, for the sake of a week, we, why don't we, we just come back up and wait until the next meeting, and then in the meantime, we'll come up and put that language together. Yeah, I close think, it. At, close the hearing at the next meeting then. Yeah, does that, does that work for the board? That's well, right. well, then we have to that work for leave you? everything open till next time, though. Yeah, right. That's yeah. the yeah. issue. So, I don't know. That's the problem. No, no, you just have to take a vote to continue it to. Okay. Right. So how about a motion to continue uh, our meeting until I, I February? I don't think we should. I, I mean, if we could just do it on the one, I would, but I don't think we should continue it on all of them because we advertised this and, you know, people had a chance to come out and I think we're opening a can of worms by continuing it for just this one narrow issue to leave everything open, to leave accessory open, flexible open space, overlay district, you have to leave them all open. I don't think it's worth it for a technical amendment that we're contemplating maybe doing or not doing. I don't support that. Well, what's the um, what? ramifications? I don't understand when you say leaving the others open. 
uh, because people that came out tonight for certain things may not have the opportunity to come out the next time. We could have more people that come in and insert more information into the process next time. We could basically compromise what we've accomplished tonight over one very narrow technical hearing. issue that's not very important. But I can keep the public hearing open and vote three of the three of the four. No, I don't think you can. I mean, it wouldn't be wise to. You shouldn't vote before the public hearing's closed. That doesn't make any sense. You hear the public input, and then you vote as a board based on the okay. information. So if you leave it open, you don't vote till it's yeah. closed. So I, I personally don't support that. I don't think it's worth for some narrow technical issue like that that, in my mind, is not that important. The mind is free to speak. We know. <laughs> are we talking okay. as the board now, or are we, yeah. what are we doing here? We're we talking as the board. <laughs> yeah. So what's anybody else in the board? I mean, I'm not opposed to keeping it open. I don't think there's a liability to do it. I'm strongly opposed to that. I think that's a big mistake over a narrow technical issue like that to leave all four of these items open. You know, we advertise as people came out to speak on it. And okay. so why don't we handle it this way? Why don't we have a motion to either to, to close the public hearing? Yep, I move we close the public hearing. Do we have a second for that? I'll second it. So, in effect, if we vote to close the public hearing, then we keep the accessory bylaw the way it is. Yep. If we vote not to close the public hearing, then we would. No, that's not correct. Okay. That's not correct. We close the public hearing, then we talk amongst ourselves, and then we vote what we want to vote based on what the public hearing is. It's two separate things. But we you close but the public hearing, then you discuss amongst as a board what your decision is going to be. They're two separate things. Yeah, you, you all can keep talking among yourselves. We could amend yeah. it to, amongst ourselves. Based, we just based are not on listening. The input from yes. the public hearing. Just two separate sort of things. You've had enough okay. um, input at this point yeah. to discuss. So okay. my motion is that we close the public oh, okay. hearing on all, all four articles. And it was seconded by Eric. Okay. Discussion? All those in favor of closing the public hearing? Aye. 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 Okay. So the public hearing is now closed. So now, if we want to discuss that, now's the time. <laughs> right. Okay. I've, because then we I've said vote. my piece. <laughs> and, and my view on it is that if, you know, I think the benefits in this far outweigh any you know little things that can be fixed along the way and we've got plenty of opportunity to do that down the road if it doesn't work out sure I mean if we don't in fact have the opportunity now then I would certainly support going forward with what we have and I think based on the timing of everything I think we should still look at this issue you know we can do it on su subsequent meetings and yeah. listen to input from whoever wants to give us input and if there's technical amendments that need to be done then we look at doing that as soon as the fall town meeting mm -hmm. I guess from my personal perspective, with all due respect to this gentleman, I think if I was buying a property, I'd actually want to go before the board personally and get that reassurance that they see me and that I'm doing everything the right way and crossing all the T's and dotting the I's. That, I mean, the, the difficulty would be, however, that you're going to do that after you've already bought the property, the way we've set it up. No, so, no we set up no. do it before. The new, the new owner, yeah. but he's not the new owner. No, no they, it's the perspective. Proposed, oh, I beg your pardon. You're yeah, right. They can we, come in before changed, the transfer. That we yeah. did change. Yeah, yeah. and that's an pardon. improvement over Marshfields because they don't yeah. have that. So if I had a purchase and sale on Dan's property that he's selling to me for a steal, um, <laughs> then I think I, I mean, as personally, it doesn't scare me. I'd actually want to come before the board and have everything done correctly in my mind. Mm -hmm. but, it's kind of a, a dual thing. One, it's a check for us to make sure people are complying. It's also a little bit of a consumer protection thing to mm -hmm. say that a new buyer is going to see this and come in front of us. We get our verification. They also understand the process. Right. So that's. And, and I think it's important that people don't view us as being frightening. Uh, you know, we, we, are, we are part of the community, and it's part of community participation. Um, and. Uh, you know, we're here to protect the neighborhoods. We're here to protect the, the buyers as well. But both of those could be done by changing the language. Yeah. But anyway. So what's the pleasure of the board? Should we vote them individually? Maybe we should vote them individually? Or you want to do them all at once? Yeah, whatever the board wants to do. I mean, let's vote them all at once. <laughs> you want to do you want to do your oh, we, we well we've already closed the public hearing so we're just yeah. voting to approve them okay uh, I I move that the planning board make a recommendation that the annual town meeting to be held on April 9th 2013 adopt the proposed zoning amendments for a temporary moratorium on medical marijuana treatment centers 
for changes to flexible open space development, the village business overlay district, and accessory dwellings per the language filed with the town clerk on 118.13 as amended at the public hearing held on uh, February 7th, 2013 as the changes are minor and within the scope of the legal advertisement. Oops, That's nice anticipation of changes. <laughs> <laughs> it was Karen who drafted nice. that. Yeah. She, she's already won because she, we're going to vote them all at once, right? <laughs> okay, do I have a second to the motion? Second. Discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 You got it. Didn't give you a chance to work on your amendment. Next item on the agenda is Form A for 36 Tickner Court, or Tickner Place, I'm sorry. Bless you. It's a big piece of the middle. Yeah, we can share. history, um, this property used to include a house that currently stands on this property. It's owned by the Archers. This house was built in 1880 or 1895, according to the Social Square, which I received today. This house here was the maid's quarters for the um, uh, maid house. An oh, accessory yeah. dwelling. <laughs> years ago. Prior to this This, this here was a, was a house that was um, lived in by the people who drove the carriages um, to the house. The carriages would be parked in this area here. <laughs> and the person that drove the carriages would have been here with his family. Um, the good old days. This building here was built, this is very old. The car they got from the assessors show that this is old. Historically, those go back to the 1900s anyway. But I'm looking at the assessor's records, this being built in uh, 1895, or 1880, I think this was 1890, and this one here didn't have a date. Why would uh, they have dates on two of them and not that one? I don't know. Um, what I have, I, I mentioned in my letter, there's some very old photographs here of these buildings. And what I want to show you is, these photographs were back in 1912, 
And this house is the same as this house. You'll see the same yeah. chimneys. Yeah. You'll see that this is the chimney of the main house, the same style. And this photograph here, this is the building in question. You can see a chimney in here as well for a fireplace. Um, these photographs go back to the early 1900s. This is the inside of the building, the, the subject building. It shows a small child here. You can see that lamp and that's very old. This radiator has curly cues in it, which goes back to the turn of the century, according to Scott Anderson from Anderson Fuel. Hmm. And they had a fireplace in here. And this was the living quarters for the man who would drive the carriages and bring the occupants to the main house. He would come in from Tickler Court, come along here, drop them off. You can see a large stairway in the front where the people would go on the stairway, bring the carriages around the here and park it. And he and his family lived in this house here. And this is actually the front of the house? That was the front of the house. That'll be interesting. That's very the interesting. The front of the oh. house had a view of the ocean. This oh. is looking right in yeah. front. This, this was all this fields. Yeah, this, this is? This no, I'm thinking the main, yeah, yes. right, but I'm thinking the main house. Yeah, the main house. So actually the front of the main house is on this side. That's the front. This is the view from the front of the house yeah. in 1907. They looked across the cleared fields right to the harbor, and you can see the lighthouse in the distance here. Mm. Wow. 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 This, cool. this is a, yeah, Very neat. If you lived in town a while, you'd hear the old timers say that at the turn of the century, you could see the ocean from almost anywhere in Situ. Yeah. Hmm. Sam Tilden used to tell me that many times. Yeah. That's that's what what wow. on they cut yeah. down all the trees <laughs> to build the boats. Well, well, it was all farming. Farming, yeah. right? Yeah. 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 farming, and they used the wood for firewood, yeah. and they used to sell firewood in Boston because they didn't have trees there, and they didn't have gas yet. So what these pictures are demonstrating is the, the age of the buildings. This is the inside of the small building. These, these were attained by Mrs. Emmett from the um, owners that lived there. Um, she's so that's the, the house inside of this house here. Pardon? This house is the, the small house I think you're yeah, talking about. It doesn't seem to yeah. have any chimney in it. This here. Oh, that's a chimney. There's a chimney. That's not even our house. That's not your house? Okay. <laughs> Okay, this, what, is the what, this was the one. This is the, the this is the office. Yeah. Where's that house? It's not. I thought this one was no. Um, no. the small, the one on the small lot. It's, it's, it's all shingles. It's all shingles. All the, the same. Office. It's all shingle style. Is the, is okay, the green well, the green well, trim is your house? Yeah. The green and, trim and the is office. Our house. Both and yeah, and then the red trim are the arch is the arch okay. house. Okay. Yeah. I just took pictures of the chimney so you can see that they're all the same. Terrific piece of property. Yeah. Well, obviously this this is that house. It's not the same one. I was gonna say that doesn't look right. right at all. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't. Well, it's hard to get in there, and it's you know real hard to look around and to see which house is which. Paul, oh, can um, I look at that just for? This is the other thing. You can see the chimneys. This is the chimney in the main house. This is the chimney in the barn. And you can see how they're they're, they're all corbelled. They're square. The tops are all corbelled. Cool as can be. Yeah, no kidding. Do you have lovely. any photographs of the small house from the outside? Is this the assessor parcel number? Uh, yeah. Numbers 32 and 36. It's got to be the address. This here mm. shows. Um, it shows the maid's house, and then that's the building in question there over the chimney oh, over that. that it's the accessories. You can see the roof line, it's A-shaped. It's the same one. I don't know if they coincide, to tell you the truth, Eric. I really don't. So that's going to be taken that way. No, it was taken this way. They were looking this house. Well, I can't, yeah, I can't turn it this way, so no. <laughs> you're, you're right. It's, it's, yeah, it's looking, so, looking this way. So, yeah, mm -hmm. so okay. looking up, up slope. Yeah. Right. So, having, you know, appreciated the historical nature of all of these buildings, what's the intention of this subdivision? Why, okay, why do we do that? I, I've done several of these. Mm -hmm. Everyone I've done, the reason they've done it is for uh, mainly estate purposes. Once you have a house on its own separate lot, mm -hmm. They can go to the bank and they, they yeah. get more. The value goes up, yeah. So this would be uh, a residence sell it off easier if you need to. that would be created on a 5,000 square foot mm -hmm. lot. 
and then could be sold as a separate property? Mm -hmm. They could. Okay. Um, I guess a couple of questions, and I'm sure that you've got answers or Laura does, but the, the only frontage this has is then on a private way. Does that present any problems, Laura? Well, um, I mean, this is yeah. a pretty narrow uh, private way. It's, it's one that um, I know the planning board looked at a Form A on this, on this road before, but it is dirt. Um, it, you know, it's, you wouldn't really be able to get two cars going by each other <coughs> on it, but, um, but you there's, know. There's no um, legal in, in, uh, I've taken restriction my in terms. Just, I, I, I this, think house here, this house here was built brand new about what, five or six years ago. The other, yeah, I mean, I, I think if you if you were really concerned about it, you might have some you know some legal basis to deny it. But um, but the, the problem the is that you've got the two existing houses example, on right? on you know you're not building a new house. Because they, they need access to the to the existing yeah. house anyway, and they already have it. Yeah. My, my other question is, you're proposing to create a 5,000 square foot lot, which is a non-conforming lot. That's right. Um, mm -hmm. Does that present any problems? I know pre-existing non-conforming is one thing, but this isn't pre-existing. We're, we're actually creating a new non-conforming lot. No, we passed the bylaw that basically allowed. allows us to, do, to split it out. Okay. Right, and, and it, it, what it says is, the intent when we passed it was to, to make it as as close to zoning as you can, but in reality, you can't always make it close to zoning. But what, um, what you're doing on this subdivision for a while, you're instantaneously creating a legal non conforming lot in 2013. Mm -hmm. Because the subdivision for a while says if you have two or more buildings on a lot that was in prior to the adoption of the subdivision control law, which is going along with 1947, mm -hmm. and you could put each building on its own lot. And, mm -hmm. and that's what we're doing now. You don't have to meet the Required setbacks for a lot area. However, if they choose to do any work on that mm -hmm. um, structure in the future, mm -hmm. you want to put an addition, they, they have to go to the zoning board for relief. Mm -hmm. They may not give it to them. Yeah, it'd be treated just like any other 5,000 yeah. square foot exactly. lot in town. Okay. You know, the access, you know, people drive down a particular place, they drive to the house, but you can see the gravel road goes all the way down here. Okay. Just and then connects to the court. Okay. There's a brand new house right here. Their driveway's right, right in here. They just, that's up for sale yet. Yeah, the road so goes here. Where is it? It's the gravel road that goes over here. Yes. Right. Okay. And the, um, how much drive down yeah. here is not coming down here. Yeah. Because yeah. yeah. I've taken my car all the way down here. And Laura's right, it's gravel and it's narrow, but it still has it's access. Okay. And when we form a, is it this house or is it this one? It's or this one here. One before. We came back up and we, we were concerned about whether there was public safety access. <coughs> that, mm -hmm. that was not an issue. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's one you might want to think twice about, about creating a new buildable lot that didn't have a house on it, but I mean, this is not really that same situation. I see. Well, that's the point of it. If it was, you know, h historically two houses, mm -hmm. you know, why would we prohibit them from separating them out? You know, it's not creating anything new. That's the point of that law, I think, is to say if it's historic, it's almost like as if it were pre-existing, non-conforming already, and we're just letting them put a lot line there. Mm -hmm. You know, some... Well, we were one of the last towns, I think, in the state, I think, to make yep. that adopted. Okay. I'm, thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm cool. Laura? Yeah. Uh, no, that's, um, that's all I had, and we've got a motion here. Yeah, I think it's really just a factual finding, you know, based yeah. on the evidence. Yeah, we feel that these were two houses on a single lot before 1954. Right, so we, we, right. that that we have that in the motion. <laughs> what was it, Bill, what we, was the thing you said that we were the last town to adopt? Adopt. What is the data? It, it, it ended up that it ended up that it used, it used oh, to be you went to okay. you go to ZBA and have okay. two, you had two lots, two houses on one lot, and you would split them. But we ended up with the, the way we operated for years. The only way we do it was a ZBA and a variance, and they wouldn't let them do it. Oh, okay. So then we came back up and we changed and adopted. What is it? M? I'm not sure what what it is, but we we adopted it, sat there, and allowed us to split that lot. Okay. Okay. Yeah. You guys ready for a motion? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I move to so, an, oh. excuse me. I just I'm, I'm just Sorry. curious about something. So are these setbacks then? Those are non-conforming as well, right? Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah. 
So what, what's, what's preventing me from making this a 2,000 square foot lot and having the property line hug the foundation? Nothing. We actually did one last year on uh, Gannett Road. Really? It was 20, 20 square foot. Okay, all right. I think they're, <laughs> they're, they don't want to create new law. No, but they're creating it, I think, what they think is a manageable law. No, I understand that. It's just, you know, what, with access to what restrictions are there against really insane doing? Well, I mean, is that, do we need to discuss ideas. that? Do we need to amend the bylaw the next round? It's <laughs> one right, of those sorry. issues. All right, not tonight. And, and also, why would list. you do that? Yeah. I don't understand. Well, amend it, you mean? No, no, no. Why would you have a lot line that hugged the foundation. Well, you could have a situation where there's two houses right oh, next so to each close. other, right, right on a frontage road or oh. something, and you may, you know, there may be planning reasons where we wouldn't want them to yeah. want a buffer and... Yeah. Rock, Cedar Point. Uh, I've, I've, I've lived, lived in developments with zero bad. lot line. <laughs> bad situation, it could so be a bad real. result yeah. if we didn't amend our bylaw. Had a row house in Philadelphia. Okay, I need a motion. <laughs> Party All right, <laughs> I move to endorse as approved under the subdivision control law, not required, a plan of land in the town of Situate, Massachusetts, located at 36 Titchener Place, prepared by Ross Engineering Company Incorporated, for Stephen W. Emmett and Deborah Emmett Pike, dated January 22, 2013, as the division of the tract of land shown is not a subdivision because two or more structures were standing on the property prior to the date of the subdivision control law went into effect in the town of Situate, which town council has determined is August 3rd, 1947, and one of, the such, one of such buildings remains standing on each of those the proposed lots. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Thank you. I have a nice, question. Nice history lesson. As a non, yeah. I keep saying this, as a non-native, Titchener, is that correct Tickler. pronunciation? Tickler. Unbelievable, yeah. Really great. Tickner. How do you pronounce it? Tickner. 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 Okay. It was just it was one huge loop all the way around from Tickner Court to Tickner Place, which is why it's so strange to have those two streets, you know, separated. separated like, yeah. yeah. It was all just one. But the connector went through the property that the connector your went property. Our property. Right. Yeah. Another one? So it was like a big driveway. I need, yeah, it was. I need three. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. There's four. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. Pick them up tomorrow afternoon. That's like. Pardon? You pick them up tomorrow afternoon. Yeah. It'll make you feel like you're back at Watertown. Around 6, 7 o'clock at night. Yeah. Yeah. So you'd be driving like from Clayton to Watertown. You'd be all set. <laughs> is, is the town hall open tomorrow? Only till noon. noon. So far, it's, it's open in the morning. But well, why don't you, Laura, just call the TV station and tell them it's closed. Oh, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> the well, they may have changed it because from what I understand, right, you said that the, the schools are closed now, right? Yeah. Because they originally yeah. were. Yeah. They just closed. Yeah. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good I can check. After the governor, yeah. The the speech. Okay. Went around and closed all the schools. Yeah, first they went to. First they went to early release, and then they waited a few hours, and they canceled them. But I saw Trisha earlier tonight, and there was no nothing that she. Wait, Webmaster, Town of Situate. Important message from emergency management officials. Message number one. That was at five o'clock, though. Yeah, if that's message number one, that's the old. No, when I was home coming to the meeting tonight, our phone rang with a message. You know, the automated that school was canceled. Okay. Right before <coughs> I left to come here. Reverse nine one one. Yeah. They're not talking about flooding by any chance at this point, right? I heard on the news that they were talking about some flooding down. Yeah. Saturday morning is yeah, the. Saturday morning. That's when the high tide around 10 a.m. Yeah. yeah. It's a 10, 10, so it'll affect us probably an hour. It'll yeah. affect me about an hour later. Moving on, accounting. Uh, well, we have the motion ready to transfer the extra money that's in the guaranteed deposit account into the general fund. Let's do it. Okay. I move to transfer $75,250.81 from the Planning Board Guarantee Deposit Account to the General Fund per the memorandum from the Town Planner to the Planning Board dated January 29th, 2013. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 We have minutes. Yeah. I'm not. Yep. I've got to go in for the morning. At least. Yeah. Not really? Yeah. Well, uh, 
Is it just that I, I, I live close enough I can walk to the office if I need to, but it might not be a bad idea. I guess it's all just the one, right? Yeah. I was looking I'm for sure two. I can okay. get in without any So <clears throat> I move that. that we approve the Situate Planning Board minutes for January 24th, 2013. Second. Those, those are the same as the, in the email? That would, the, now that this is, is the meeting that I was brain dead on and didn't come, so I should not vote. Is that correct? If you're not, um, if you're not was, there, which here. part of that do you want me to? You, don't, don't even. <laughs> yeah, know you were. That. It, be, it be, says be here kind. you were not here and you were brain dead. Yes. So it does say that literally. So you could vote on either of those. <laughs> either of those options. Yeah, I can. I can ratify that. I am brain okay. dead. Got a motion, and second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Super. Do you have a pen? Liaison reports. I'll give you one. I went to the open space. I don't know if you saw the Mariner today. Not yet. They had, uh, they, we've come back up and we've hired the Conway group to come in and look at uh, the open space that we've got, see how it's utilized and what the people would like to see for it. Well, the Conway group led out at Mount Hope uh, was last Thursday. Is that right, Karen? Thursday? It was last Thursday. And they had a facilitator for the Conway group. Uh, out and it basically had filled up Mount Hope was it was a pretty good attendance and it's a pretty good it was I thought there was going to be more dialogue amongst everybody but basically it was to fill out the fill out the forms uh, you know which areas you liked which areas you thought needed protected and that sort of thing and then they're going to come back up and make that as part of the proposal to come back to to the town with Great. is there I was curious since they are kind of consolidating are these things are they trying to brand it as one I, I use that brand but I mean like a the, little it, it, they've just referred to it as the screen space okay. and, uh, but I mean and you can get to, there's enough trails out there now that you can literally get from one you know one parcel to the other but there's no place that it shows you where one parcel is ends and the other begins well I guess the thing is we've branded the parcel we've called it the situate town forest right yeah uh, I'm so it's uh, a little at this point they're not branded though. No. Okay. <laughs> like some that might be a good marketing strategy. Okay. West End Woodlands or something. Yeah, yeah, something like that. And there was also um, a meeting of the facility management steering committee, which was a week ago Monday. Right. And I'm on the committee and Steve Stevens' wife's on the committee. Um, I didn't make that because we were voting at CPC, so um, there's another meeting on that on the 12th, which will be next Tuesday. So I will attend that. So that leads us to the town planner's report. Well, you, men you mentioned, can you give us a quick update on CPC? We haven't finished voting all of the articles. What we've done is we've come back up and um, the two major articles in terms of trails are uh, past that we talked about. Uh, one is from Countryway from Ronnie Shones all the way down to Greenbush. That was originally came in at something in the neighborhood of 900,000. Right. And what we've done is because we're trying to keep the expenditures in the million two to a million five range, which is about what we get this year, about a million two we get this year. Yeah, but we got an, what we've looked to do is to see if they could come back and logically split that in, in, in some sort of half. So maybe spend four to five hundred thousand dollars and do part of it this year, part of it in the subsequent year. And the, we held off on the harbor walk. We've held on that pending some more information to see whether that logically could be split into, into halves. Hmm. Okay, so we held, we held off on that. And then there's uh, one other article that, that came back out that was held, and that is. Uh, putting some of the town archives on microfiche. And the question becomes is not do we want to preserve them, the question becomes is part of that expenditure is, is a microfiche reader and a creator, you know. What's, what's the advantage of microfiche over, di over uh, disks? It's digitizing. Yeah. They last longer. Really? Digitized? Digitized has, a, has a, it's an eight to a ten year life. Oh. If I put them on a CD or yeah. put them on a tape, yeah. yeah really? Microfiche is obviously much longer than that. What about if we were to put them in some sort of cloud arrangement that was yeah, self-renewing? Yeah. Just file them. Yeah. But then I, you, you may, may be able to do that. Right? But what we've looked at is the question is do, do we want to spend $30,000 for the microfiche? 
and the ability to come back up and create it. I think mm. you're going to find that technology is, you know, 10 years from now, people going to be gone. know what you're yeah. talking about. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right now, right now, if you talk to all the people that do archives, that's the state of the art. Really? I, I mean, I, 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 I deal a lot with, with genealogical research. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, for years, all that stuff was on microfilm and microfish, and that's way on its way out. Yeah. You know, the, in, yeah. in fact, there's a huge project right now to digitize uh, the uh, 1940 census, uh, which uh, just got completed. Um, you know, it was distributed literally around the world, mm -hmm. and it's done. Yeah. Would you say the 1940? The 1940 census has now become public. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, th these are people within living memory now that were, that were part of the census. Um, and so you can literally go up and look up your grandparents or whoever there, and there's all kinds of information about households okay. and uh, jobs and, you know, where people were living and all that kind of stuff. But then some of the other projects that we voted, we voted for, I think Dan, you and I talked about the, the lights for the skate rink, the, the lights for the field in the back, uh, striping of basketball courts, not only here, but in, but in Hum Rock mm -hmm. um, on it. And then smaller expenditures for the uh, historical, um, basically putting the Widow's Peak back on the Little Red Schoolhouse. Um, we voted not to take the one horse shay and, and restore that because we really don't have a place to put it. It's, a, it's Cushing's one horse, originally shay, <laughs> it's, it's shay uh, on it. And, but we've come back up and we come back up to do some additional inspection work on the on Larson Tower, and as well as some archives of some books. They've got books that were show. Um, it, at certain points at the harbor of all the, sh all the cargo that came in and the cargo that was unloaded wow. and that. Mm -hmm. And that, so they have it on a, almost on a daily basis that are now going to be kept at the lighthouse, preserved wow, and kept at the lighthouse. That's pretty good for them. I mean, it's phenomenal. Cool. Yeah. Uh, right there. So that's, that's where we are. So we should finalize, oh, and we had $10,000 for an open space plan to do an update to the open space mm -hmm. plan. There used to be a carriage shed out behind the, the Unitarian Church next to the tower. Oh, yeah? Do you remember that? I, they, well, and I don't. Um, and it was just that. It was a carriage shed for the people who came to church and wanted yeah. to put their carriages in there. And there was probably eight, six or at least six or eight or ten, you know, stalls kind of. Yeah. Wow. So Parking that would be garage. a good place for the shed. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but that's the, the concern. The concern is, is even the Smithsonian would like to have it. The question is it doesn't fit. It's too big to fit in any place where they could put it, and we really don't have a place to put it. Shame. Right. But I mean, yeah. it, I mean, it's just it's a historical, real mm -hmm. historical thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So maybe when they put the new ex uh, addition on the library, they can sort of create a an exhibit space for that. Maybe we can keep this building. And keep put it right here. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Town of Planner report. Uh, the application for the uh, technical assistance from MAPC for the Economic Development committee is just about ready to go. I'll it's going to go that. out under Trisha's signature. That's the um, DOTC letter? Yeah. yeah, yeah I'll, I'll sign that. Yeah. Oh, good. Um, we didn't quite talk about it, but um, I guess you all would, would agree that we should have a planning board um, letter of support. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yep. So, good. And um, let's see. The um, project on sea level rise is is really starting to get going. We've got a consultant hired. Um, their name is Kleinfelder out of Cambridge. Um, I've heard good things about them. We're probably going to have a page on the town website, um, probably be connected to the planning board site, to the conservation site on sea level rise and um, why we should be thinking about it. Um, so. There's a couple of very good sites, and I'm sure you've seen them, um, that, t that have mapping and talk about that a lot. NOAA has one, and somebody else has one. Oh, the Digital Coasts? I guess that's it, I, uh, right, yeah. Yeah, that's going to be one of the So links, links to that probably ought to be a part of what you put on the, on the website. Yeah, that was a link we were, we were going to do. Yeah. So, uh, and then I wanted to pass out some um, draft reports to town meeting. These are the um, kind of political statements, if you will, about why these articles are important, why the planning board supports them. And this is something that you all should vote on. But before you know, we vote on them, I'd like to get everybody's comments and thoughts and you know, if there's something that was left out or needs to be changed or rearranged or whatever, you know, please let me know. 
Okay. It, it looks like uh, there's been a change in, in the process because as I remembered it, what we used to do was to come back up and indicate that we had a report that had to be had to be read. Uh, I mean, <coughs> just the order of who speaks when? No. This is a report sitting there saying that the planning board on such and such held the date. Oh, this, this includes that also? Because the last um, town meeting, a couple of town meetings that we've had recently, we've not made that report. I think, I think you did. I think you had to. Otherwise, the well, article. I actually should have read these tonight. Because you know? all that goes to the AG. Well, we can vote on the next time. Yeah. No, no, no. no when no, you all hadn't seen it, I didn't want to. Yeah. You know. No, but I guess I, to I, explain I, for the public hearing, this would have been a good way to explain why we were um, amending the articles for the public. Because it's in language that's yeah. very understandable. Yeah, I mean, it's very similar to the letter that we put that it was sent to the board of select. So, yeah. <coughs> um, and I think that's it from here. Okay, so you want us to look at that and get back to you? Can you email these around too if you have them? Oh, sure. Uh, yeah. Easier yeah. to remember. It's easier. Then we can just respond. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's good. Ooh. Individually. Do I have okay. a second for Bob's motion? <laughs> second. All those in favor? Aye. All right. Aye. We are adjourned. Excellent.